Um, what we found is that it actually took two additional weeks of postmortem aging for that control group to reach a similar Warner Bratzler shear force value that we achieved immediately in 90 minutes wow. of tumbling, which was pretty, pretty cool to see. Hello, me folks. Welcome back to the Info Podcast. My name is Francisco Nohari. I'm your host today. Uh, it's been uh, some time that I really wanted to to sit down um, with Doctor Twelve, uh, and uh, we have today with us because they they conducted a research um, uh, not too long ago. He was still uh, in grad school um, uh, at Purdue uh, with Doctor Kim about uh, tumbling, and and a lot of the times we don't think about tumbling or, or some of the how the equipment that we have. Um, in our facilities to potentially have a, a positive effect on on tenderness, and I think for we'll be talking about this today. Welcome, Doctor Twelve, for for having uh, some time. Are you busy? I know it's a, it's been the the beginning of the semester this uh, last couple of weeks, and and thank you very much for for being here. Well, thanks for having me, Francisco. I'm really really excited to talk about this, um, and it's definitely something I'm very passionate about, more on the teaching side now for my job, but uh, still very like, or like to be very involved in the research side of things as well. Absolutely. You know, I, I really, I'm very excited because I think, I really think that, that by doing very minimum on your side, you can have a, a very good positive effects on tenderness. Please tell us about, about this research that you guys conducted. Um, maybe you can walk us through of the, a little bit of the design, what was the, the hypothesis and why was this research conducted so sure um so i'll say i mean the first thing that you said hit the nail right on the head from the standpoint of uh this is a very simple uh experimental design and it's something that actually whenever we were coming up with the idea um dr kim came to where our office was and uh kind of said like you know get pitched this idea and i was like there's no way nobody's never you know nobody's thought of doing the study before um and actually as we you know took this to meetings and then went to publish papers on it that was one of the biggest kind of pushbacks we got is tumbling's been something that's been done for decades in the meat industry and how could there be you know really anything new or novel happening in the world of tumbling uh but i mean kind of what was happening at the same time is uh, we were looking at some really interesting work that was coming out of Texas Tech. Uh, so it was Dr. Mark Miller and Dr. Andrea Garman, um, who were doing work on tumbling beef flanks. So beef flanks are a muscle that we consider to be underutilized or undervalued because it has some palatability issues when it comes to tenderness. Uh, so they were essentially looking at doing different injection marinating, tumbling treatments to improve palatability of those muscles. And um, one of the things that they were really interested in was, I think, achieving clean label, which is also a big push in industry right now. Uh, but actually, one of the studies that we kind of based a lot of uh, the work that we did off of, uh, they had a positive control group that was beef flanks that were tumbled uh, without the brine solution, just to see what the tumbling process alone could do. And what they found probably, you know, doesn't bode well for us in terms of uh, why we would think this would be a, a good process, but they found that for their conditions, that tumbling alone uh, did not achieve tenderization in the beef flanks. Uh, but we still looked at that. We really liked the idea of being able to maybe apply the process to a different muscle. So obviously, if you think about the flank, it's a very, you know, wide, flat muscle, big muscle fibers, a lot of connective tissue. And so we wanted to see if maybe we could apply this to other cuts, um, some tender, some, you know, somewhere in the middle, some of them very tough. Um, and the other piece of the puzzle was looking at uh, postmortem aging. So in their study, they tumbled and then essentially uh, froze those samples pretty soon after and then evaluated them after thawing. Uh, but we were interested in seeing if maybe disrupting that muscle structure 
and then allowing those products to age could have some synergistic effect on tenderization. So maybe we could uh, release calcium that's in the sarcoplasmic reticulum or improve calpain autolysis or uh, really any number of things. So that was kind of the rationale uh, for the studies that we conducted. Um, in general, so I would kind of just broad overview, we did um, I have three papers published in this area. Um, the work that we've done the mo or muscle we've done the most work on is the strip loin, which is no stranger to us in meat science. Uh, but we also looked at uh, some intermediate tenderness muscles from the sirloin. So we had the top sirloin, the sirloin cap, and the tri-tip, as well as the eye of round uh, muscle, which of course comes from the round primal, has a lot of palatability issues, has a lot of connective tissue. It looks very attractive, looks like it will make you know a really good steak, but unfortunately, uh, there's some, some issues there in terms of getting it to become tender. Uh, so just briefly experimental design. Uh, we just we already had a tumbler. You know, we're like a lot of small meat processes at our facility. So we had access to a Lance LT30 500 pound capacity tumbler. Um, we vacuum packed our sections, tumbled them depending on the study anywhere from 40 minutes to 120 minutes, which would equate to about 350 to 1,000 tumbling cycles and allowed them to age afterwards either you know zero days so we would immediately evaluate them just to see what tumbling did but also allow them to age anywhere from 10 to 14 additional days this is very important that you're saying because uh, when you first uh, started talking about this uh, you mentioned this first study with uh, um, with some other muscles that i mean you say the flank and a lot of the times when i go to a plant a lot of the muscles that are tumbled or marinated or typically like the inside skirt or the flank or those um, muscles with heavy connective tissue. But I guess uh, this is this is a good hypothesis that maybe a, a, another uh, contributor for like this type of muscles you mentioned from the round or from the from the sirloin and the lingusimal lumorum, obviously one of the most researched muscles in, in, in meat science. And tell us... Tell us a, a little bit about the, the, I guess we can go through our results, but I really want to talk about the tumbling. How did you establish the tumbling times? Uh, did you, because there's, with the lens, with any tum, tumbler on the market, you have some options that you can reverse or uh, uh, pause by 20 minutes, pause 20 minutes and, and go back and forth. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of options there. Yeah, uh, and, and and maybe we can, we can go from there and then just, we can hop on, on the results. Sure. Um. So I will say probably a kind of unscientific uh, rationale for why 8.5 RPM was our uh, revolutions that we chose is because that's where our machine maxed out at. So um, that's kind of what we were trying to target. And really just because there's not a ton of work out there on tumbling fresh meats without the brine or marinade solution, uh, we were really trying to model our treatments off of the the treatment or the the group that came out of uh, Texas Tech, and so uh, their treatment was 20 minutes at 10 RPM, um, and so we were at 8.5 RPM. So we know we needed to go a little bit longer than that. So uh, we started our first treatment, or our, our most I guess mild treatment was 40 minutes, um, and then we went all the way up to 120 minutes. Um, as far as reversing and uh, a lot of you talked about intermittent tumbling, so there's you can either tumble continuously or intermittent. Um, the the main purpose of doing an intermittent tumbling cycle is to allow that product to essentially rest and uptake the brine or marinade solution. Because we're tumbling without the brine or marinade solution, we're simply tumbling the meat in its packaging. Uh, that's not something that we really thought was going to be uh, very relevant to the type of product that we were trying to to work on. Perfect. And I think we can, we can, I, and it is, it is great because a lot of the times we think about tumbling either to add a modernation, as you said, or to add some flavor 
I mean, but uh, in obviously, I mean, you get some yield as well because you you add some some other uh, things like salt or phosphate to to help uh, retain that water. But we don't typically think about tumbling uh, as a as a tenderness um, aid. Tell me about the results. And and I, I know you did some protein degradation studies, and we have some some of our listenership. Um, they're not meat scientists, so I guess we can we can talk about the protein degradation part and also how how that links with some of the the subjective and objective results you have from from tenderness um, for your results in in this study. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so kind of the first study that we conducted was just looking at the strip loin. Um, so for that study, we did either a control group, which was not tumbled. We had 60 or 90 minutes of tumbling. Um, and what we found was immediately for those Warner Bratz, their shear force values, which is our measure of instrumental tenderness, uh, we got a huge reduction, uh, which was really, really exciting to see. Uh, so we started, I believe, check my notes really quick, but we were around 3.5 kilograms in our control group. Um, which is uh, in the tender category, but it's on the uh, the upper end. So obviously, for strip loins, we're most of the time still going to be somewhere in that that tender, or uh, sometimes we can creep into intermediate. Uh, and this but, is a, a what time of tumbling? This is just or this was what? for our control. Uh, our control. The control group okay. was around three and a half kilograms. Um, immediately after tumbling for the ninety minutes, uh, we took that down to two point two, which is. Wow. That's when we think about tenderness categories, uh, you know, very tender uh, is quite a bit above that. So we were well within the very tender category. Um, what we found is that it actually took two additional weeks of postmortem aging for that control group to reach a similar Warner Bratzler shear force value that we achieved immediately in 90 minutes wow. of tumbling, which was pretty, pretty cool to see. Um, we did do some protein work, so uh, troponin T degradation, desin degradation, uh, those are essentially looking at proteins that help the myofibrils um, and the muscle fibers stay together um, and give them their structural integrity. And so what we found is that there was some evidence that tumbling was going to have some positive impact on degrading those uh, proteins with postmortem aging. Um, I will say to kind of skip ahead to the follow-up study that we did, uh, which was a similar design. Uh, we just had more uh, experimental units and we had uh, more treatments, so 40, 80, and 120 minutes of tumbling. Uh, we did find similar things for proteolysis. So tumbling plus aging does seem to have some positive impact on protein degradation. Uh, but by and large, I would say that this is mostly due to just physically fragmenting those muscle fibers. So we did a lot of transmission electron microscopy. Um, so spent a lot of time uh, on an electron microscope looking at the myofibrils and looking at their uh, integrity. And it was really cool to see because you see a lot of Z-line degradation. Uh, you see, you know, fragments where there's going to be, you know, six to 10 adjacent myofibrils that have, you know, essentially where they've entirely fragmented uh, apart from one another. And so I would say primarily this is a physical process more than something that's enzymatic, uh, but the enzymes definitely do play a role. And actually there was a master's student doing a similar uh, project um, alongside while we were doing these. And she applied a, uh, tumbling process early postmortem and did get some good results in terms of uh, calpane autolysis. So seeing that calpanes were activated early postmortem um, through the tumbling process. In my studies, we tumbled at five to seven days postmortem. So we didn't see the same thing in terms of calpanes, but likely that's just because we're at that later time point. Um, to kind of get into intramuscular differences, uh, one thing with that is that when we look at a lot of those different assays that we did, so we did the transmission electron microscopy, we did Western blots for those different proteins, Desmond and Troponin T, 
we did an assay called myofibril fragmentation index, which helps us determine essentially uh, how much degradation has occurred to the, the structure of those uh, muscle fibers. And by and large, we saw almost identical things across the board in the eye of round as we saw for the strip loin. And so that's something that we were, again, really excited about because that's suggesting that you're going to have really good tenderness of the uh, eye of round. And that's something if you know, you're pretty familiar with meat science and different beef cuts, that would be huge. Um, the thing was, is that we uh, started around um, 4.3 kilograms of shear force for the eye of round. And even though we saw all those differences in terms of uh, proteolysis and fragmentation, uh, we stayed there. So any duration of tumbling was not effective at uh, tenderizing the eye of round muscle. Interesting. And uh, how about the, the consumer consumer data? Um, so one thing that we did see um, that was a concern with um, our instrumental things is we looked at water holding capacity. So how well is the product holding onto its water? You can imagine because we're tumbling without a brine solution, that's going to raise some red flags in terms of, you know, causing unacceptable purge or moisture loss from the product. Um, by and large, I would say our purge losses were pretty low. Um, acceptable if you saw them in the package. I don't think that you would really look twice at them as having unacceptable purge loss. And that was, uh, fortunately, even though we did have some increased cooking loss by a few percentage points, uh, consumers could not detect a difference in juiciness. The other thing that we saw for the strip pulling is that tumbling for any duration, 40, 80, 120 minutes, improved uh, tenderness liking as well as overall liking to a similar extent that was achieved with postmortem aging between essentially a uh, five day and a 15 day postmortem time point. So I would say that from a, a sensory perspective, uh, you know, tumbling is going to help improve tenderness. And at least what we saw in our studies is that it's not going to have a very big negative impact on uh, juiciness, as well as the other component that you probably need to think about is going to be flavor, where we expect that flavor to a certain extent is going to improve during aging. However, flavor liking was the same across all of our treatments. Similar thing, though, for the eye of round, um, we did, again, the, the separate 120-person consumer panel for the eye of round. And just like we didn't move the needle in terms of uh, instrumental tenderness, uh, really across the board, consumers found that palatability attributes, tenderness included, were going to be mostly similar across the board. The exception to that is that we did see that the combination of an extended duration of tumbling, so 120 minutes, and 10 additional days of postmortem aging did have a slightly higher tenderness liking compared to some of the other treatment combinations. So I wouldn't rule out that this isn't, you know, going to be uh, an effective process on the eye of brown. I think there just needs to be, you know, either a more severe sort of tumbling yeah. treatment to really yeah. break up those muscle fibers. More aggressive tumbling, perhaps, or more time. Or something that's going to degrade connective tissue, because that's the other piece of the puzzle, is we did look at collagen and some of the characteristics of collagen, like solubility, and found that tumbling is not going to affect collagen degradation. So if you have a muscle that's really high in collagen, then you're probably not going to do a really good job at uh, improving its tenderness, especially in the case for us that we're cooking everything fast and dry like you would a steak, and you're not doing that slow, moist heat cookery that can solubilize collagen. Very interesting. I, I really like the uh, the factor that your statement on on you can you can have by tumbling a very similar effect that you would have at, at day fourteen of aging or postmortem aging on mm -hmm. the on the lingismal dorm, right? I think that's that's a very good, I mean, outcome or at least that you can communicate with with the audience, right? Like you can, Absolutely. you can save time. 
Yeah. And when you consider um, the most recent National Beef Tenderness Survey, it's around 26 days. Um, you know, of course, there's going to be quite a bit of variability across that. But around 26 days of post-fabrication aging time uh, that most cuts are receiving the beef industry before they reach the consumers. And so if we can say through this process that you can knock, you know, a couple of weeks off of that, that's that's pretty huge in terms of being able to increase product turnover and still guarantee that you're going to give consumers a palatable product. Excellent. Excellent. And I'm sure I'm and this is this is I, I love this. I love this because as you said in the very beginning, I mean I guarantee you a lot of the people listening that have a, a meat facility, they have a, a small tumbler. Yeah. So they can they can test. So they can they can if they are harvesting their animals or they want to do I mean they can literally do some testing on that on the and there's no no other or additional investment on equipment. So it's a good, very inexpensive option for them to do. So Absolutely. Well, uh, we're getting to the end, and and we have other topics that we'll like to to visit later with you. Um, for the people that uh, don't know you, please tell us a little bit about your background. Um, how how this uh, love for meat science started, this passion, and I, I guess that that's something I wanted to ask you first too. Sure, absolutely. Um, so I've always been super passionate about food. Um. Growing up, I was dead set. Always thought I was going to go into uh, culinary was where my passion was, but um, also was pretty good at, at science and um, was really interested in doing that kind of pers or, um, pathway as well. And so I ended up going to Purdue, uh, majored in animal science with the focus on animal products, which was uh, our concentration, which was focused on meat, milk, and eggs. So I took a lot of food science courses, uh, started working with Dr. Brad Kim, 2017. Um, and it was just a, a perfect fit. Uh, he's been a fantastic mentor to me as well as uh, my, my classmates that were in his lab as well. Uh, also took a meat science course with Dr. Stacy Zelli, who was on my committee uh, through my, my graduate degree. And I think it's just one of those things is when you you have two people like that that are so passionate about meat science, you know, it's hard not to get passionate about it as well. So I love working with them. Uh, they're both awesome, awesome people. Uh, so I actually ended up after it was really good fit working with Dr. Kim um, as a, as a um, undergraduate student. And I actually went with decided to go ahead and go straight into a PhD and bypass a master's. So uh, I think Brad wanted me to stick around for, he got me for four more years uh, with a PhD. And I think he would have kept me for several more um, if he uh, was able to, uh, but just a great fit. So graduated with that in 2022 and started my position at Northwest Missouri State University as an assistant professor of animal and food sciences uh, in the School of Agricultural Sciences uh, here this year, or this past year. So I've been here teaching for just over one year. And absolutely love it. Well, thank you all for your time. Um, we're not very far. You're uh, in uh, Maryville, we're in Kansas City. So hopefully yes. we can get together sometime. And, and thank you a lot again awesome. for your time. And yeah, thank I, you. I hope, I really I hope yeah, and I really hope, and, and I'm sure a lot of people will like, Really, does that does that really help in that way? So, uh, thank you a lot for your time, and we'll see you. In the, we'll see you soon. All right, thank you.